This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Start learning for free with the link in the description, and the first 200 get 20% off the annual premium subscription. In the early 1980s, Britain began discussing with China the future of its last remaining major colony, Hong Kong. Immediately, Beijing made clear, in no uncertain terms, that it would neither accept an independent Hong Kong nor a Chinese one administered by Britain. Instead, it suggested an alternative, a temporary 50-year limbo as a separate special administrative region of the PRC. This new, never-before-tried proposal raised many questions, from the trivial to the existential. What flag would be flown? What currency would be used? Which citizenship would they hold? And how much of Britain's presence would remain? With no guiding historical precedent with which to refer, as its neighbor Macau had yet to be handed over by Portugal, the answers to these questions were wide open. Legally, only the new territories were leased, set to expire after 99 years in 1997. The geographically smaller but well-developed Hong Kong Island and Kowloon Peninsula had been surrendered in perpetuity. Initially, the British considered retaining their rightful territory to become a small, independent state. And as proof of just how wide open the possibilities, there was even a slightly serious proposal to resettle its 5 million inhabitants in Northern Ireland. Beijing, however, soon reminded Britain that the island received its water and supplies from the mainland, whose pipes could easily be shut off. Thus, at least one question was answered. All of Hong Kong would become Chinese soil when the lease expired in 97. Of those remaining, that of citizenship, something at the very heart of identity, proved to be especially significant and contentious. Until the 1960s, all British nationals, whether born on the British Isles or one of its overseas colonies like Hong Kong, were permitted to enter and stay in the UK as full, unrestricted citizens. As its empire began unwinding in the 60s and 70s, however, it feared an influx of immigrants from its African and Asian colonies. New laws were passed, making it more difficult for these groups to enter unless they or their families were, quote, connected to the UK. In 1981, the British Nationality Act created three new categories. British citizens, for residents of the UK, British overseas citizens, and for Hong Kong and other crown colonies, British dependent territory citizens. With this law, British citizenship was fundamentally redefined to exclude millions of overseas citizens from the right to abode, the ability to enter and stay in the UK at will and without restriction. From then on, Hong Kongers were relegated to a new form of literal second-class citizenship in a thinly veiled attempt to stop non-white immigration to the UK. And while this change was not solely aimed at them, it affected the territory in a very unique way. While citizens of other colonies lost their right to abode as they gained that of their new independent country, those in Hong Kong were to be handed over to an existing country whose commitments had not yet been tested. In the eyes of locals, Britain had betrayed them, a feeling which would only intensify as the years went on. Because the city would soon no longer be a British dependent territory, a new status was created specifically for its special circumstance, called the British National Overseas Passport. It, like its predecessor, lacked the right to abode in the UK, but could only be applied for before the handover. The Chinese, though, refused to accept the embarrassing idea that Hong Kongers would remain British nationals of any kind after 97. China insisted that, at midnight on the day of the handover, all would lose their British status and instantly become Chinese nationals. Their old passports could be used as travel documents, but not as proof of British citizenship. Then, in 1989, the tanks of the People's Liberation Army rolled into Tiananmen Square, and the slowly growing collective unease felt in Hong Kong reached a tipping point. A million stunned citizens took to the streets, whose fear of uncertainty had become simply fear. But there was still some hope. Luckily, the British position was far from singular. The local Hong Kong government, led by its last governor, Chris Patton, felt this rising tension and lobbied Britain on their behalf. London expressed fear that if it gave the BNO right to abode, three million immigrants might suddenly flood the UK, overwhelming its social system. 
This despite the fact that 30 million white Commonwealth citizens in Australia, Canada, and New Zealand also could have immigrated at any given time. It would be wrong, they said, to promise the right to abode if they could not fulfill these obligations in the event of an emergency. They also argued doing so would violate its joint declaration with China, the document basis for the handover. And yet, 10 months later, Britain did just that. The British Nationality Selection Scheme gave full British citizenship to 50,000 hand-picked residents along with their spouse and children under 18. This elite group was chosen directly by the governor and was based on four categories of people, including professionals and civil servants. Selection was based primarily on a point system, which rewarded, among other things, English proficiency and connections to the UK. Those not deemed important or British enough by their colonizers were simply out of luck. Still, knowing of these inadequacies, Patton continued lobbying, increasingly finding himself caught between locals and officials in Britain. Ironically, both sides made the same accusation. Locals suggested not giving the right to abode was a sign Britain must not be confident in Hong Kong's post-handover prospects, if it genuinely feared a mass exodus. At the same time, Britain argued that giving the right to abode was a sign Patton wasn't confident in his negotiations with China, since otherwise it wouldn't be necessary. Amidst this larger debacle, Lord Patton also fought to resolve two unusual complications. First, Chinese law stated that only ethnically Chinese Hong Kongers would automatically become Chinese nationals at the time of the handover. But the BNO passport was acquired by application, meaning that if one were not ethnically Chinese and did not apply for the BNO passport, at the time of the handover, their dependent territory citizenship status would expire. But the Chinese would refuse to naturalize them, leaving them effectively stateless. One Indian family in particular had lived in British Hong Kong for 60 years, received British educations, spoke with British accents, and yet only some were granted full British citizenship while their brothers and sisters were not. Even after learning of these circumstances, the British Home Office held the position for years that they would simply become British overseas citizens, and that if they were indeed forced out of Hong Kong, Britain would then consider them for immigration. Only in the last year before the handover did Britain finally acquiesce. Second was the question of visas. A new special administrative region passport would be created for after the handover, featuring the same national emblem and illustration of the Great Wall as that of the mainland. The question was whether its holders would be given visa-free access to the UK. Here too, the British Home Office pushed back suggesting anti-immigration voters would make no distinction between the right to abode and visa-free access. Patton, in turn, countered that not doing so would infuriate the Chinese, who would lobby for fewer rights for the BNO passport, making it even less valuable. Hong Kong would also likely impose visa restrictions on its 400,000 annual British visitors. After much back and forth, Beijing assured them that the SAR passport would only be available to holders of permanent Hong Kong ID cards, only in Hong Kong, and only by Hong Kong immigration authorities. Six-month visa-free access was secured, and the Prime Minister announced, We in Britain will have continuing responsibilities to the people of Hong Kong, and will be watching to see that the letter and spirit of the joint declaration are honored, now, next year, and for 50 years beyond words deliberately chosen to prevent any future British politician from reneging, or at least to make a fool of anyone who tried. These two rare successes in the long, drawn-out lead-up to the handover were celebrated, but still left what many considered the largest source of unease, the status of the BNO passport. This tension became palpable in the final months before the handover, as tens of thousands stood in line to register for the British passport 24 hours before the deadline. Finally, the day came. On July 1st, 1997, after nearly two decades of negotiations, vague promises, worry, and skepticism, Hong Kong became China. Citizenship, however, always remained contentious, and in the eyes of many, an unforgivable black mark on Britain's legacy. It has even since been revealed that Britain asked Portugal not to give full citizenship to Macau residents, which would make it look bad in comparison. Some renounced their British citizenship in a pledge of support to China. Others lost credibility for holding foreign passports, which some said undermined their claims of loyalty. 
Over time, the B&O passport, once seen as a valuable insurance policy, became more of an expensive piece of paper. Compared to the Hong Kong SAR passport, it's three times as costly, offers 48 fewer visa-free countries and territories, and perhaps most embarrassing, is less useful when entering the UK. While Hong Kong passports allow expedited immigration, holders of the B&O fill out landing cards and enter the UK like any other foreigner. They also can't apply for Australian visas online and are banned from becoming chief executive. Most of its holders will never have use for its few benefits, like the right to join the British Armed Forces and get married under British law. And as one final nail in the coffin, because China views the B&O as merely a travel document, it does not allow its holders British consular access anywhere on Chinese soil, whether on the mainland, Macau, or Hong Kong. In practice, the B&O is similar to the status of those born in American Samoa to non-US citizen parents. Despite being on American soil, such a person is regarded as a US national, but not a US citizen, and thus not allowed to vote, serve on a jury, or apply for restricted government jobs. Although unlike B&O holders, they do have the right to reside in any part of the country. That is, until, possibly, now. After Beijing announced a national security bill which will outlaw secession, subversion, and terrorism against the Chinese national government in Hong Kong, Britain responded that it's now, 23 years later, reconsidering the rights of B&O passports. So far, it's offered to extend visa-free stays from 6 to extendable periods of 12 months, allowing for work and study, and creating a path for citizenship. Although this applies to all, roughly 3 million holders of the passport, whether or not they're currently renewed, as well as their dependents, it leaves out the majority of its population. Given that the B&O could only be applied for before 1997 and can't be passed down, those under 23, a large swath of Hong Kong's protesters, will likely be ineligible. Many details are yet unknown. Will these rights be extended to all residents? What exactly will be the criteria for permanent citizenship? And how will China retaliate? In the absence of any answers to these questions, many see Britain's offer as more political than practical. In truth, the right to abode was always misunderstood as a debate about immigration, when, in fact, it was one of confidence. Rather than encourage migration, it was always intended to prevent it. Patton knew the health of Hong Kong's bureaucracy would be left in the hands of a relatively small number of highly educated, well-off individuals. The right to abode was about instilling the confidence necessary to keep them in Hong Kong after the handover, along with their democratic ideals. It would also act as a check on Beijing, the knowledge that it may lose the city's most talented if it did not keep them satisfied. Indeed, famously, in the years before the handover, hundreds of thousands of Hong Kongers fled to Canada, Australia, the US, UK, and elsewhere. Their reasons, however, are largely misunderstood. Some, of course, stayed abroad, where they established Cantonese as the language of Chinatowns. Many, on the other hand, stayed only long enough to gain citizenship before returning to Hong Kong with this new insurance plan. This is so common, in fact, it has a name, the return tide of Hong Kong. An estimated 35% of those who left in the 80s returned later. Another, astronaut, refers to one family member, usually the father, who stayed making money in Hong Kong while the rest of the family lived abroad, in Vancouver, Sydney, San Francisco, or elsewhere, to gain citizenship. Such is the predicament of Hong Kongers. They love their city, their language, and their way of life. They want, above all else, and as long as possible, to stay. And yet, they also know these things are temporary. Now, just as foreign passports act as a sort of insurance plan for Hong Kongers, a strong understanding of math, science, and especially computer science is the universal insurance plan that can help you earn better grades, get better jobs, and write out recessions like the one we're currently in. Brilliant holds the philosophy that most of these topics are really best learned a little bit at a time, every day, over weeks or months. It takes big topics like cryptocurrency, solar energy, and vector calculus, breaks them down into small interactive exercises, and explains them in a way that actually makes sense. Brilliant gives you a new puzzle or problem to solve every day on its beautifully made mobile app and website, where you can also ask questions, discuss solutions, and dive deeper into whatever topic interests you most. 
Start learning today for free with the link in the description. The first 200 people will also get 20% off the annual premium subscription.